Hello there and welcome to the Catholic Underground, which is your Catholic weekly guide to the digital continent. I'm Father Chris Decker. Joining us this week, we've got the uh, the usual gang. Uh, Father Ryan Humphreys is over there in Campy, Louisiana. Actually, no, no. <laughs> Father Ryan's in Natchitoches, Louisiana today <laughs> because uh, his rectory is being wheeled in in two parts. Hi, Father. Well, it's already been wheeled in, but uh, we're still waiting for the, for the parts to be duct taped together by a crowd of rednecks who are utterly able to do such a thing. Until then, I am trapped in the historic, uh, beautiful rest here in uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana. Very nice. <laughs> that was quite a story for the top of the show. Uh, Joshua LeBlanc joining us from uh, Bayou, uh, Bayou Land Computer Solutions World Headquarters there in uh, Abbeville, Louisiana. Hello, Joshua. Hello. Hello. Yes, so uh, we're all here. Father Ryan is here uh, in Vox. Uh, his voice is here um, because he doesn't have a, a good internet connection, even in Natchitoches. Uh, it's very strange how that works. <laughs> but uh, we, we keep pressing on, and uh, even if you don't have the internet and you do have some sort of data connection, you've caught on to Bishop Jenke, uh, the, official, uh, the official bishop and, and chaplain of uh, the Scooby-Doo gang. Um, he is he is creating a, a bit of a hissy fit, and we at Catholic Under, Underground love a good hissy fit. And uh, it seems that uh, that Bishop Jenke, uh, he is by the way the Bishop of Peoria, gave a sermon at a men's conference, and he mentioned some names, didn't he? Do that, uh, Father Ryan, and these names made people mad. Yes, he he mentioned in the same speech U.S. President Barack Obama, German despot Adolf Hitler, and Russian tyrant Joseph Stalin. And he pointed out that Hitler and Stalin, uh, both as part of their leadership techniques, pretended to tolerate the church, uh, but in fact went out of their way to close down the church and to pressure the church, and made a special, uh, he made special mention of the fact that both Stalin and Hitler enforced their ideologies by, by forcing public education, by forcing all state services uh, welfare services and health care to be run by the government mm -hmm. uh, so effectively they could do their evil. And he did not say that Obama had sent Jews to the gas chamber, and he did not say that Obama had killed 50 million people, but he did point out that, that we're in a kind of a situation where it's a slippery slope. And the same thing that was a slippery slope in the time of Hitler and of Stalin is what we're seeing now. Right. And, uh, of course, yeah. hissy fit. And <clears throat> And that's that's the real thing is is the church not called to read the signs of the times, and is that not what Bishop Jinky was doing? wasn't Wasn't that what you would say he was doing? No, absolutely. He he's saying, look, you know, if we if we look at history, if we if we understand history, we ought to have learned from what happened in the '30s, '40s, and '50s, mm -hmm. and it's it, we're looking at the same sorts of things. And if we pay attention to history, we should look up and say we cannot allow this to happen, uh, especially as regards the questions of the imposition of religious or the, the removal of religious freedom. Yeah. Because while Hitler and Stalin both always said, oh, yes, yes, we, we love the church, uh, it, was, it was a bald-faced lie. And we're seeing the same mm -hmm. sort of thing coming from our government, the United States, and it would be absolute idiocy and foolishness to ignore that and to pretend, oh, but, but President Obama is a good guy. Well, everybody thought Hitler was a good guy when they elected him as the, as the chancellor of the nation. Yeah. He didn't really turn out to be kind of a jerk until he started murdering people. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, you can't really see what's going to happen. That's why they call it a slippery slope. Now, now Joshua, the thing that really makes this uh, story is not also that he used the names, but somebody reported him to the IRS. Now, uh, Joshua, you pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, <laughs> a lot of them actually. Yeah, <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Now, now this this wasn't something that that should be able to get you in tax trouble, is it? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, there was an activist group, uh, the Americans United for the Separation of the Church, mm -hmm. and they basically made a complaint to the IRS about Bishop Jenke, um, and 
you know, the issues with regards to nonprofits are that's, you know, as Father Ryan would say, it's a slippery slope there, too, because the laws aren't very clear because there's certain uh, nobody really defines what it means to be advocating. And it seems very clear that Bishop Jakey was not advocating uh, the choice of a candidate over another candidate. Right. He was simply making a, uh, a, a comparison of what Obama's policies are as compared to past policies of other individuals. And, you know, I don't think he's wrong, obviously, uh, in what he's, the, the case he's made. I certainly don't think the IRS is going to have any, any leeway to, to make any claims against Bishop, Bishop Jinky here. Um, yeah. You notice, you know, there have been other individuals who have, who have made, you know, in the secular news who have said that it wasn't until that they made – uh, remarks about the Obama administration publicly that they started getting audited by the IRS. Right. And I think uh, the IRS is going to, you know, attempt uh, something here, but I, I don't know that it's going to be taken seriously. I'm hoping not anyway. Well, now, now, Father, what can the IRS do? I mean, ultimately. Well, the way it works is that some years ago, and I don't remember the exact year, there was a law that was passed that said every Catholic church has to integrate. You can't just be a church. Now mm. you have to be a corporation. And of course, the, at the time, the U.S. bishops were free of that, that difficulty of having a backbone, and they just watched it happen and said nothing about it. And so the way it works in most dioceses is, is that the bishop is the corporate president of every single parish, and then the pastor is named the corporate secretary and has full power of attorney. And so I don't know the exact way it's arranged in Peoria, but mm -hmm. if the IRS looks and says, this man is doing this out of the other, they could basically revoke the nonprofit status. The non which basically just means that every parish in the diocese would then have to pay income tax on on the monies that they they get as contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, that amount could be as little as ten, twelve percent. It could be as high as thirty four percent. And it also means that everybody making contributions doesn't get a can't list those as tax exempt uh, yeah. on their taxes. So it, it hurts the parishioners and the church pretty badly. Right. Uh, now, could it could it be said that if uh, if a politician, we won't say who, um, if a politician wanted to bring down the church as an organization, that this would be the way to do it? Yes. Okay. I mean, it wouldn't bring the church down, but it would it would put an end effectively to the program mentality mm -hmm. that the Catholic Church needs to have a, a ministry to the aged and a ministry to. Uh, this group and a ministry to those people who want to learn mm -hmm. Reiki and a ministry right. to those people who have yoga lattes. If you bring an end to that, and for better or for worse, that's probably 60% of Catholic parishes in the United States mm -hmm. that operate on that model of having a big staff, you know, and big budget. And yeah. it would it would require then a dramatic cutting down of expenditures. And uh, for a lot of reasons, that could be really devastating to the church in the U.S. Sure. And I, I also think one issue that would be, you know, devastating, too, is the fact that then the church becomes ineligible for any kind of federal funding at all for any of any other, you know, as you noted, Father, for any programs or anything they want to do. So a lot of, you know, funds that dioceses may receive from federal grants or grants from other nonprofit organizations, then the church starts to become ineligible for those because they're no longer a nonprofit right. organization. Now, but now here's a question. Um, not to get too far afield, but um, what would the positive aspect of that be for the church? Well, do you think that, that would mean effectively that if the church did not have to tiptoe around the IRS rules about candidates in particular, mm -hmm. it means that we could get into a situation where the bishop basically gets on the pulpit and says, "Okay, everybody, we're voting for this candidate, and we're voting for that candidate," and I would imagine pretty because the U.S. Catholic voting bloc is is a pretty big deal. If the yeah. bishop, even in my diocese, were to stand up and say, this is who we're voting for, I would imagine you'd see something somewhere between 60 and 75 percent of the Catholics voting for that person, mm -hmm. and it would make the church the kind of political power which was in the 30s and 40s, uh, which is something that, that really brought, uh, that's, that, that's brought the Democratic Party to power. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, Exactly. You know, it, it would be a dramatic, devastating turn of events, uh, especially as more and more U.S. bishops have grown that backbone and have stood up to to an injustices that the church has been putting up with for a long time. 
not just from the Democratic Party, but also from the Republican Party and from from government officials of Wall Street. And Father Corey in the chat room uh, says that, that this is why they won't remove the tax exemption, in my opinion, because it would indeed remove that gag, if you will, at, at election time. Um, I, I have another another uh, pos- position. <laughs> I have another thing to posit, too. And uh, away from, from the political stuff, uh, what about... Um, what about in the sacramental life of the church in the United States? If we were forced to, to move away from the program mentality and we were forced to, to move away from being uh, financially able to pay everybody for, you know, coming to, to play music or um, to, to do this out of the other, um, wouldn't, wouldn't all of a sudden we become more focused on the mass? Wouldn't yeah. maybe we become more focused on the things that really matter about our salvation? You know, that's that's something that that i often think about is that if if the world uh does fall in on our heads in terms mm-hmm. of the, the finances and whatnot <coughs> well what always happens is the church will still be here yeah and i think She'll the still one i think the one aspect that you'd really start to see is you really see the idea of apostolates in the church return where something is lay focused because of the fact if you remember even the 30s and 40s and 50s uh a lot of things in the church, if something wanted to be done, people would approach Father and say, hey, Father, we really want to do this. Father Can would we say, do go, it? do, it would say, yeah, go yeah. and Go and do. And you had individuals like uh, Frank Sheed who would, who would start their own groups and not expect the church to bankroll the projects they wanted to do. So not everything in, on the planet had to be a ministry. You actually had mm-hmm. real apostolates with the right. laity taking charge of that. I think you'd see that again because mm-hmm. the church would have to say, uh, look, we, if we want to do this, you know, you're going to have to you're going to have to spearhead it and we're not going to have the money. And you would really see the apostolate return. Right. And that's that's an interesting thing, because one of the things that the Holy Father talks about a lot is the, the shrinking of the church. You know, that the, the church of the future, perhaps maybe a smaller church. Mm-hmm. And and I wonder if some of those signs of the times aren't being connected. Uh, and Bishop Jenke maybe just began with a little pickaxe that can be a good sermon. You know, to kind of uh, pick away at, at some of this, um, some of this notion. I don't know. Um, yeah. Bishop Jenke, by the way, is is also a positor uh, for the cause of Archbishop Sheen, it, it being in Peoria. Um, right. And and so he he's uh, he's definitely okay in my book from that, and and especially standing up uh, for for such an important thing. Yeah. And um, in in the bishops also, uh, we can mention really quickly, uh, are beginning to to note that. Uh, that we ought to be civilly disobedient. Mm. Now, this is—I mean, this is something pretty, pretty significant in terms of. Uh, I believe, Father, it's the HHS mandate, correct? That's right. That's that was uh, the that's been the big, the big central rallying point. Has mm-hmm. been the the mandate. That's right, uh, and and to to allow yeah, Catholics and, and the, to say we're not going to go along with this. Have basically used that and said, look, if we don't stand by, we cannot. These these rights be eroded. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been watching the wrong for a long time. If you if you remember in the UK and in Canada, for the last year or two, we've seen bishops and priests be sent to jail or pay major fines mm-hmm. for giving a sermon. You know about right. about homosexuality. You know, and that's considered hate speech. Um, and in in UK and in Canada, and you know, we've been watching the rights of the church. To stand up for herself be eroded more and more and more and so the bishops are calling for a period of civil disobedience to stand up we're going to go and it means if it means getting arrested that's fine i mean the image of a bishop in handcuffs being put into a cop car you know mm-hmm. that's that's a powerful powerful image um that that may very well wake up a lot of people in this country to what's really going on yeah. and hopefully we'll wake up people in other countries as well because the uk Germany, Spain, Australia, Canada. We're not the only nation in, you know, that's experiencing this revival of what I would consider to be kind of a crazy uh, totalitarian, you know, pre-totalitarian mentality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it, it's scary, but at the same time, there's a great deal of hope, too. You know, And so yeah. uh, to, to folks like Bishop Jenke, who you see there on the screen, uh, if you're watching our video podcast, Bishop Jenke, we salute you. Uh, you and your brother bishops who are standing up for the truth, uh, keep keep doing it. In other Fahrenheit 451 <laughs> kind of news, there was an invisible power grab that happened this January, um, and it came from unlikely Estonia. 
in our own <laughs> United States. They set it. Uh, they set up an alternate DNS to help users infected with uh, the DNS changer Trojan. Right now, that doesn't sound too bad, except for everybody's DNS was shifted, right? Well, basically, any, it, anyone who got the the Trojan. To kind of explain basically how this happens, a a DNS system is basically like an internet telephone book. So if you want to know someone's telephone number, you pick up a phone book and you look up the name and the name tells you what number to call. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, the same thing happens on the internet. If you choose to go to something like, you know, AOL.com, well, that, ha that has to be looked up to find out what, that, what AOL's IP address is to get you there. Well, basically... Uh, what was happening is that in Estonia, from what I gather, some uh, hackers had created this Trojan virus that when installed on your computer um, would give them access to changing your DNS over to them and allow them to intercept that transmission so that they could tell you wrong information, basically. So basically in the, in the idea of, of telephone language is they'd give you the wrong phone number, even though you thought it was correct. And so their servers are starting to, 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 to pass all this information through it. And the government realized that they couldn't cut these servers off immediately because in doing that, they would actually cut off a whole bunch of people's internet who, was, um, who were still using it and had this vi who were infected with this Trojan. So they're leaving the servers on or their version of the servers on until July mm -hmm. uh, and telling people you need to remove this Trojan horse from your computer. You know, there are different tools out there on the FBI's website that they've listed that you can f look to see if you have it. And remove it. Or you'll get a bad DNS lookup. Or you'll get a bad DNS lookup. So if you don't remove it come July, your internet's just simply not going to work. Okay. Hmm. So, but, but this is, I, I mean, know. in being able to do this, this shows that, uh, that it's possible for the government uh, to, to kind of shift us over to its version of the internet instead of something that would be kind of uh, free, if you will. Well, it, well, it should be. Oh, go ahead, Josh. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it should be a little scary, not because it, they, it, I mean, it's, it's a workaround and it's not a particularly complicated one. It ought to be a little scary, though, because it happens so quietly and so under the, under the, of everything. Yeah. That, you know, it's kind of astounding that our government was able just to flip the switch. Right. And all of a sudden, a large group of people had no idea yeah. that major, major components of the Internet were being replaced by what amounts to a pirate version of the same thing. And so there are some anxiety and, and some freak, freaked out because this is the first step or it could be the first step toward us being behind the great firewall of China you know, or the great firewall of the United States. And that's kind of scary. Um, yeah, and, it should be. Yeah, yeah, it should be. And, and uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll go ahead and, and, uh, and leave it there for the moment. Let us know, backchat at catholicunderground.com. Uh, maybe you got that Trojan horse. Uh, if you didn't, we'll catch you on the flip side. You're watching and listening to the Catholic Underground. This portion of Catholic Underground is brought to you by you. Your prayer and financial support are what keeps us going. So please visit catholicunderground.com slash donate to find out more. All right, welcome back to the CatholicUnderground.com, which is your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. On one box, we got Joshua LeBlanc, and on the other box, we got Father Ryan Humphreys, and uh, we're talking about everything faith and tech and probably a little bit in between. Well, if you were following the tubes today, you noted that Dropbox may have its days numbered, and that is because uh, Google, who apparently is not evil, um, at least <laughs> by all intents and purposes, uh, they launched their own Dropbox-like like service isn't that right i haven't i actually haven't seen a whole lot about it yet maybe it's because it's uh, too new um but uh but sure enough the web is all a twitter uh, literally so uh josh have you had a chance to look at this yet i watched the promo video that google has because as is typical with a google product uh the day of launch you go to access it and it says uh coming soon for you um so it basically means it's in beta and i don't have access to it yet but I know Father Ryan was telling me earlier that the Google Drive is similar to SkyDrive, which is a Microsoft product, and I'm not really familiar with either one of those and how mm -hmm. that's, very, that's different from Dropbox, which is what I think most of us use. Yeah, and now, Father Ryan, you use uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of data that's in the cloud these days um, with your Dropbox, especially because you're moving around like a, like a uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, keep, I keep about 40 gigs uh, in, a, in a Dropbox account. Um, and I'm, I'm very seriously considering Google Drive 
Um, there, there are a number of features that are important for me as a nerd. And one of the most important ones for me is the ability to maintain my own file structure, uh -huh. uh, you know, folders and subfolders and sub subfolders. That integrates with and, your uh, present file you know, that, structure that's on your really computer. That's a really big deal for me. And that's hard to do with something like iCloud, which doesn't have any ability to do something like that. Something like Box, which has its own, you know, problems. And of course, we don't know what Google Drive will do. And of course, I don't touch SkyDrive because, frankly, it's Windows. <laughs> right now, now um, we have we have uh, for those of us watching the video podcast up on the screen. There's a side by side comparison of everything here: a Dropbox, SkyDrive, iCloud, and mm -hmm. Box. I've never heard of Box. I don't know what that is. Um, but they're Box basically .net. It's a really good. Um, they're similar. Well, the big deal for a lot of these is developer APIs, Father. You need to have mm -hmm. lots and lots of ability for somebody who's writing an Android app or an iOS app or something mm -hmm. to be able to do something cool with your product. Okay. Um, and all of the big five out there that can do these kinds of cool things. One of the examples, Google Drive, for example, is integrated with Lulu. So uh -huh. if you want to publish a document, you just go to Lulu and say, look, go to my Google Drive and find this file and you're done. You don't have mm -hmm. to upload anything or anything like that. That's really cool. So, so there's some cool integration and things like that that each of them does. I'm going to stick with Dropbox for the time being, although Google Drive is significantly less expensive. You know, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, very uh, 25 gigs for $30 a year for Google Drive, uh, and then 50 gigs for $100 a year in Dropbox. There is a, a pretty significant difference there. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, according to Gizmodo, Gizmodo is actually saying that SkyDrive is the best bang for the buck. Um, you know, I've never used SkyDrive. I'm a, still a big Dropbox fan. I think it's really going to be hard to beat because Dropbox has been around for at least a couple of years now mm -hmm. and has really worked their way into many environments. I know myself, you start off with, with two gigs in Dropbox, uh, but with referrals to other people as well as, you know, betas and all this, you can increase your space. And I'm up to 11.2 gigs that I'm not paying for. And so for me, that's still more than any of these other services are offering and Google Drive, as far as I can tell, SkyDrive, iCloud, Box, all of those do not have any kind of free upgrade options. Um, one of the other benefit, the, one of the things that are that's a, a big deal too, is the fact that uh, Google Drive launched, and it doesn't have an iOS app yet. They're saying it's going to come soon, but it hasn't been released yet for iOS or Android. And also, um, they're saying they're coming out with a Linux client soon, but that's still not out yet, and that really cuts a lot of nerds off. Yeah, you got to go Linux if you're going to get the nerds. Yeah. Now, what's really cool and I really do like is that the maximum file size for uploads is 10 gigabytes. Oh, that Whereas is... for, for Dropbox, it's 300 megs. So. Oh, no, I, now that I did not know. Yeah, and well, that's that, a big that's, deal. That's through the web interface. Ah, uh, when I see. You're, when you're dragging a file on computer, you can get unlimited file size. Okay. Yeah, from desktop, so Right. But if you if you want to use the web interface or the iOS interface, you are limited to 300 megs. I got you. I, I will say I'm with Father Ryan on this is that it has to be something that's integrated to my file system. This this thing of having a drag and drop interface only is not going to really cut it for me. Yeah, and, and Dropbox is great that way. I'll probably stick with Dropbox myself. Um, you can let us know what you use. Uh, back chatting, back chat, CatholicUnderground.com. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you in Minnesota, <laughs> Jewish guy calls his mother. <laughs> For those of you, everybody else, uh, back chat at catholicunderground.com. Now, Father Ryan uh, squeezed this into the, um, the the show notes because he likes to cry. Well, I don't know that I like to cry. I also don't know that I heart Taylor Swift, but, you know, <laughs> you, you've told people lots of things. I have. Um, but, no, uh, I, I like viral videos, and uh, Procter & Gamble, of all people, made a video about the Olympics that has gone viral. And, uh, you know, I watched it, and, I, and immediately, you know, at the end, I just couldn't help myself. And frankly, I think anyone with a soul is going to have a hard time not crying because the story is how these little kids, you know, they, they work so hard to be good at these different things, to be good at these sports, you know. And, and then at the end, you see how they, their mothers are the ones who have, have worked just as hard, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how much these people appreciate the love their mothers have shown them. And with Mother's Day, you know, two weeks down the road, I can't help it. You know, it's just such a, a great video. And if you don't cry, it's because you don't have a soul. <laughs> yeah, uh, regardless of, uh, of where Procter & Gamble is on the, um, on the, you know, should we buy their products list, mm -hmm. it's a really good commercial. 
um, because actually it span it goes it it doesn't even mention any of the things that they do that might be anti life. Um, you know, so I, I want to make that, uh, that disclaimer just in case somebody <laughs> says, now father, you know, you showed that part of that commercial and, and Procter and Gamble, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, uh, we, of course, um, granted, but, uh, but sometimes when you make a good commercial, you just got to look at it, huh? At least that's what I'm choosing to do. Well, you know, Aquinas says that you have to, you have to, uh, to judge the art based on itself, not the artist. Beautifully said father. Uh, I'm sorry, not father. Yeah, uh, not quite. <laughs> aspirant. <laughs> Gosh, Bo Cardinal Bo. Right. Bo Cardinal Bo. Yeah, maybe this would be the appropriate time for us to to cart this out. Um, for those of you watching us on the video <laughs> on the video feed, um, when we were in the seminary, which is pretty much how so many stories begin, when we were in the seminary, um, I was uh, writing a paper one night, and we had just done kind of a spoof video, which seminarians are wont to do. And uh, and this is what we came up with. It is uh, it is a picture. Well, it's an animated GIF. Of, uh, of Joshua as a cardinal and then him blasting off into the stratosphere. We're very proud of it. I, <laughs> we'll watch it one more time and then return to your oh. regular program. <laughs> Get it out. That's right. If, uh, if, if, you, if you don't watch us already on the video podcast, this is a good reason to do it. Uh, you can find us at catholicunderground.com and you can click on uh, episode number 193 and that's, uh, and that's a promise. So... In other news, uh, the uh, the Olympic Athletes Hub is also online. If you, Father Ryan, you're you're a big Olympic freak. You follow the Olympics. Love the Olympics. the uh, The International Olympics Committee, who I generally hate on principle, because every year they or every four years they come back and manage to screw up every sport I like by installing some <laughs> dumb new rule. Right. Uh, which is the reason our our uh, archery people now carry bows that look like they were made by the Muppets, or not the Muppets, the uh, Fraggles in Fraggle Rock. Right. Um, the they've created a really excellent service, and they deserve praise for it. It's called the Olympic Athletes Hub. It's at hub.olympic, without an S, dot, olympic.org. It's an aggregation of all their Twitter and Facebook accounts for all Olympic athletes from any country. Anybody who wants any Olympic athlete can, can add their information. And you're basically looking at a huge uh, you know, supply of information about what these people are doing, what they're training, all these kinds of things. The only thing that makes it annoying is, of course, the IOC now has gone out of their way to make it illegal for certain people uh, to, to tweet certain things at certain times. Like when you're in the middle of the sport, you can't tweet. And that's really annoying. Yeah. Um, but all Not surprising. Things, you know, it's, it's a cool thing. And frankly, anything good coming from the IOC deserves my attention because I hate them on principle. <laughs> okay. Good. No, yeah. that's, that's clear. Uh, <laughs> Cardinal Burke, uh, whom we like, spoke recently in Rome at a seminar for those who are working in the field of communications in the church. And uh, he talked basically about the stuff that we talk about. He said that, that caution as well as control over content and where it's distributed are needed, because in the field of communications, uh, there's a great potential for good. He also says that uh, social media and things of that nature can be turned to harm the faithful. And uh, of course, um, this is this is a beautiful thing because he was doing this at a uh, speak uh, at a uh, seminar for those who work in media and communications for dioceses. Now, of course, this is uh, all taking place in Rome, which is of course why we didn't go. Um, but uh, but Josh, he, he even carts out canon law, mm -hmm. um, naming that that whenever we communicate, it is actually part of of the of the office of the priest and the bishop. Um, or to, exactly to be watchful that no uh, no harm is done to the faith and morals, and but that we should be close to those employing the instruments of social communications uh, for the sake of evangelization. I think that's cool. Exactly. Yep. Uh, he also questioned. Now this is interesting. He questioned whether some forms of digital media are appropriate for evangelization. Um, he say that some of these instruments actually do harm to the mission through their inappropriate or mis uh, misguided use. So he didn't say which. He didn't say Facebook. He didn't say Twitter. Um, but um, it, it is it is interesting to you know sh just because you can use something, should you? We always ask that question right. too. Yeah. Um, now, uh, yeah. That's that's all I had on the story. I expected somebody else to comment, but well, <laughs> well I mean, I, I could I could think of a handful of of uh, situations where there's there's social media and it theoretically could be used very very good. I'm thinking something like. Uh, video chat, you know, something like, right. um, like FaceTime or Skype. You right, know, a great idea. It could work, it yeah. could work very well, and in fact, 
um, you know, it could become something very useful, but it also allows kind of intimacy that is dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you have to ask yourself, well, you know, is, is that kind of intimacy necessary for evangelization? And some people might say, well, I could use it or so-and-so could use it. Uh, you know, but that, that does become dangerous. When you think of something like a uh, random video chat, you know, like what was that, that site that chat everybody roulette. was talking about? Uh, yeah. Video chat, chat roulette, roulette or something yeah. like that. You know, and, and you have something that is, you know, it becomes, there's no reasonable way for that kind of randomness to become something useful. Right. Um, and, and you could say similar things uh, to, to like <laughs> the wiving tweeting scale. To considering buying, this is a skill that tweets how fat you are every morning. Yeah, you know, that's a cool technology, and it may encourage you to lose weight. But you got to say, should we really try to find a way to turn that into something we can use for evangelization, or should we just realize lose weight? You know, just lose weight. That's fine. You know, <laughs> that's, take off some pounds. You know what I mean? Really, it doesn't have to be necessarily joined to the mission of the church. It just. <laughs> It is what it is. I mean. That's right. Because because all things considered, whenever we're talking about the mission of the church, we want to widen our tent, you know, <laughs> enlarge your heart, and that's it. You went there. I was thinking about it. No, I mean, yeah, I think he's right. I think there are certain areas that have to be judged, but I'd be interested to know exactly what intentionally he was thinking of, and I, I think he he intentionally didn't come out and say certain things because maybe he recognized the fact that he's not the authority. Mm-hmm. on what those should be, but simply throwing that and positing that as an idea right. that there are certain things out there uh, that, you know, could not be used for evangelization. Just be interested to know more about exactly what in his uh, his paradigm would that would be. You, you know what's interesting is is uh, my mouse has just died. <laughs> oh, fun. <laughs> right here on the show. Right here. And it's it's Think Geek Batteries, too. Um, so just, uh, just like... Uh, um, Cardinal Burke could say some things could be used that, that do not better um, <laughs> communications. This this would be one of them, in my humble opinion, because right now I can't do anything. Father Ryan, are you still with us? I am, but I'm hearing a lot of static. As long as it's not bothering you all, it's not bothering me. Well, it's it's you, actually. It's your static. Yeah, we hear you. So I'm, uh-huh. I'm not moving at all. It's, it's not coming from my phone. Okay, well. So I don't know where it's coming from. I've, I've tried jostling. Maybe it's the mouse. Oh, my mouse is back from the dead. Well, good. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, I'm nasty. I'm nasty. <laughs> That's right. It is truly risen. My, <laughs> my mouse. Well, that was uh, that was quite a sidebar. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't even know where to go. I'm completely de- derailed. Well, the I, one thing I would I would add to all of that too is looking back at what he says from the canons because of Canon eight, you know, eight twenty three, where it says the pastors have the right and duty to be watchful so that no harm is done to the faith or morals of the Christian faithful through writings or use of instruments of social communication. Now, one of the great things about that is the fact that we recognize that while we as individuals, like few fathers as a priest and Father Ryan as a priest and myself as a layperson, yeah. we, we do have the, uh, the obligation to evangelize or we use these social tools that ultimately we are responsible to someone other than ourselves, that is our local bishop, our local pastor, and that we're doing things in accordance yep. with what they want of us. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Looking for some fresh Catholic content? Head over to catholicunderground.com, the website that has more than just the Catholic Underground podcast. You'll find new shows, video, and stuff being updated all the time. You'll be able to listen right from your iPhone or other mobile device, and you'll also be able to see the video as it comes out each week. You'll also have access to live programming as well as find out more about our mission and help us out. CatholicUnderground.com. We are Faith Gone Digital. Alrighty, welcome back to the Catholic Underground Podcast, your weekly guide to the digital continent. Josh Shalom on one side, Father Ryan on the other. And uh, we'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing here with what we call our 2012 giving campaign. Did you know? that there is a doodad that would let us do a much better full high-definition show. Ten years ago, that cost $25,000. Five years ago, it cost $15,000. Now it costs $5,000. But that's $5,000 on top of uh, paying for bandwidth, uh, replacing Josh's hairpiece from time to time, <laughs> and, uh, and also preparing to host the Catholicon Expo. Um, and it's actually been about two years since we've done a fundraising campaign. 
And so, uh, as you know, uh, over on CatholicUnderground.com, we've been uh, we've been trying to to uh, to raise a little bit so that we can do all the stuff that Catholic Underground's trying to do, plus Catholicon Expo. Uh, Father Ryan, um, I, I know that um, we were talking a lot about uh, about helping to grow the technology of the podcast uh, a little bit uh, a couple of days ago. And <laughs> and he's a uh, you know. He's in absentia. That's right. He certainly. I'm sorry, Father. I, the, the the static has got to the point where I can't can't rehear much of anything that's going on. Oh, sorry. good, good. That's uh, that's as it should be. Um, so we just uh, keep on rolling. If you want to help us out, you can go to cucast.me slash give to us, or you can go to catholicunderground.com dot com um, and, and click the button there to to help us out. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and drop Father Ryan for just a minute. Uh, Joshua, why don't we start the uh, the Catholicon plug, and while we do that, I'm going to try and call Father Ryan. Well, for those of you, unless you've been living under a rock and you've not been listening somehow. to this podcast. Somehow. Right, exactly, somehow. You know about Catholicon. Our first inaugural veil held in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston last year was wildly successful. Many people were so excited that I got calls after the event asking, when are we going to do another one? Well, that's coming up September 14th through 16th, 2012 in New New Orleans, Louisiana. Beautiful, beautiful in downtown New Orleans. You're going to be in walking distance of Jackson Square uh, where the cathedral is, the French Quarter. Great shopping is some of the best food you will ever have on the face of the planet. Uh, The theme for this year's event is Christ, the perfect communicator, how Jesus came among us and now how he directs us to go among others. So the question is, who should come to Catholicon? Catholicon is not simply just for journalists, bloggers, media professionals, even though we are gearing it towards those people. But we're also looking for catechists, teachers, theologians, sacred musicians, uh, Catholic software developers. If you feel the call to be a missionary to the digital continent in some way, whether it's you feel the Lord is calling you to create a blog, a podcast, anything, online journals that you want public, uh, the public to read, Come to Catholicon. Registration is now open. You yes. can do that online at uh, cucast.me slash register2012. Um, again, that's cucast.me slash register2012. And we're looking for sponsors. Isn't that right, Father? We are looking for sponsors. Uh, if you would like to sponsor the event, uh, if you'd like to expo at the event, you can certainly do that by going over to catholiconexpo.com and, uh, and letting us know uh, how you want to plug in. And in what uh, what level that you'd like to give at? Uh, because this we really one of the beautiful things about Catholicon is that we give it over to you uh, in a very exactly. Real sense. It's it's not about, and that's one of the real things we talked about before. We don't want to make this about uh, going to an event where you listen to one speaker talk the entire time. It's about people meeting each other and finding out what other people are doing. And so it's about networking. Right. And it's about talking to one another and saying, this is what I'm doing. What are, we, what are you doing? And how do we do this all together? Yeah. And Father Ryan, you did a lot of the work with, um, with kind of developing the vision for Catholicon. Yeah, putting together the, the, just the, the outlines of talks and the theme ideas and things like that. And we're, we're particularly excited about this, this year with the, the notion of Christ, the perfect communicator, mm-hmm. uh, something that came from Father Z's mouth, actually, at last year's conference. Yeah. Uh, and turned out to be such a, a great, great topic to work with. Yeah, we, we were very excited about that. In fact, whenever he said it, um, he was speaking, I think, at the VIP dinner, Josh. Exactly. Uh, what it was. And we all kind of looked at each other and went, huh, a theology yep. of communication, a philosophy uh, based upon maybe, maybe even pre-Christian notions mm-hmm. uh, about how we communicate and then how that is joined with, uh, with Christ's mission as the perfect communicator. And I think we'd be remiss to uh, neglect to say that, of course, Father Z is going to be there this year. That's correct. Last year. That's right. We, we, hadn't, we hadn't actually announced that yet, I don't think, uh, that, that Father Z said, oh, yeah, I'll be there. I'm coming. Yeah, he's going to be there in all, his, in all his glory. So if you've always wanted to meet the mind behind, <laughs> behind what does the prayer really say. That's right. He'll also bring that. Uh, it's in, it's in a, a Univac system that he, he carts around with him. Okay. He might sign swag. He might, yeah. If you if you have your your shirt or or maybe your white cassock, you will you'll sign that. <laughs> Tab collars, any of that. That's right. That's right. Uh, Father Ryan, we're 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 also looking forward to the after party with uh, with Father Z too. The man likes red wine. What can I say? <laughs> we all do. I don't think anybody. There's not a man, woman, or child alive today that doesn't enjoy a nice glass of red wine. 
Uh, and, and so, so we're, we're really looking forward to seeing everyone at Catholicon. That's September 14th through 16th, 2012. Be there. It's so important to the mission of the church, and we would love to meet you. That's right. Uh, so what we're going to do now uh, from Catholicon, we hope to see you there. Uh, buy your tickets. The registration's open and everything. We're going to go quickly to the beginning of, uh, of our picks of the week. I'm going to do mine, then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back. All right, we had no audio for that uh, bump, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> my pick of the week is uh, is something known as Mint.com. Now, Father Ryan actually uh, turned me on to Mint.com today, and uh, basically, it it tracks all of your your money stuffs. And uh, this uh, this is a great little thing. It integrates. It has an iPhone app. It has an iPad app. And uh, what you do is you enter in all of your your credit card information and your uh, data for um, your uh, your your bank. And it mm -hmm. actually pulls all that stuff in, even your car payments and things like that. And it also gives you uh, some budgeting options, so it can tell you how much you're over budget on things that you've bought. Like, for example, my coffee budget was uh, was awful high this month for whatever reason. Um, and uh, and I only went to the coffee shop two times. I guess it depends on which coffee shop you go to. It also can send you alerts. Um, it's it's safe and it's secure, and it's also free, which is a kind of cool thing. And, uh, and so that's, um, that's my pick of the week, mint.com, again, free, and, uh, and it's very much uh, available uh, for, for anybody who, um, who wants it. Uh, so what we're going to do is take an, an itty-bitty break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to thecatholicunderground.com. Uh, we're continuing with our picks of the week, and uh, we go first to, uh, well, next to, to Joshua LeBlanc. Joshua? Well, it's following on Father Chris's pick of the week. Mine is also mint. Uh, not the same kind of mint, though. Mint thins. No, no, I didn't say Thin Mints. I said Mint Thins. Oh, is that, are, do they call them that? They do. Look, you see, I got the box right here. <laughs> mint Thin Cookies. And I'm not just endorsing these. Their, their peanut butter is great. I normally don't endorse specific grocery stores or chains, but Dollar General seems to be the only place that carries these, and I love a good knockoff. Um, <laughs> and because don't these, say that too loudly, <laughs> <laughs> these these are basically Dollar General's version of Girl Scout cookies. Now, you've heard us talk on this program before about Girl Scouts and their ties to Planned Parenthood, not to mention that those things are three fifty a box, and Girl Scouts get about 20 cents from each of those boxes. These boxes of knockoff Girl Scout cookies taste exactly the same. When I say exactly, I'm not saying similar. I'm telling you, you will not tell the difference. They are packaged exactly like Girl Scout cookies. And they are a dollar ninety-five a box. American, American, <laughs> not Euro, anything, or Father Ryan Euro exchange rate or anything like that. A dollar ninety-five, and it comes and they have you know, basically the thin mints, the you know peanut butter uh, patties, and uh, the Samoas. They don't call it that; they call it something else. And they also have a Devil's Food one, uh, which and these things are amazing. In fact, I hate Father Ryan and Father Chris for telling me about these because now I'm buying these in cases. <laughs> Josh, aren't you diabetic? Yes, and my foot will be gone by next year. Thank you both. Lay off, I'm starving. <laughs> These things are great. I mean, I just, I, I can't even tell you. I, they, they have to be. They have to be the same baker. <laughs> who bakes Girl Scout cookies and is making these. He's before. thought about this so much. Well, I mean, Josh. the baker... The baker on here is Dolgen Corp LLC in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. So I'm going to actually research this. Since Father Ryan can research Copacabana. <laughs> there it is. Amazing. Josh is a passionate man. He is passionate about these cookies. That's yeah. right. Well, let's take our two-minute break, and we'll, we'll be right back uh, right here on the Catholic Underground, and you're going to get Father Ryan's pick of the week, which in no way can be like Josh's. Alrighty, welcome back to CatholicUnderground.com. If you've stuck with us this long, you might as well stick with us just a few more minutes. 
Father Ryan, your pick of the week, uh, will it elicit more laughs than, than the last one with Josh? No. No, it won't. <laughs> um, my pick of the week, uh, is it, it answers a specific problem I have. I use uh, Reader to get RSS feeds. Uh-huh. I also uh, will use uh, Chrome or, or Safari to read the web. And then on my, my iOS device, I've got Zite and I've got Flipboard. And I've got another reader app there. And I just end up with a lot of places where I need to save stuff to read later. Um, mm-hmm. And, of course, there's a service called Read It Later that I had been using for a while. And, uh, and it kind of started to lose some of its joy. But recently they rebranded the whole thing as Pocket, you know, mm-hmm. not to be confused with Pocket Lent or anything like that. Um, <laughs> and they have created a great iOS app and a really good web app that takes all the simplicity of something like Instapaper uh, along with a pile of features that something like Delicious would have and made a great solution. Um, And so it's called Pocket. It's at getpocket.com. They have a web app. They have iOS apps. They have Android apps. Uh, It's spectacular. It's a great way to to take lots and lots of news in and then very quickly and conveniently uh, look at the 20 or 30 or 40 articles you really want to read uh, from a multitude of different sources. And uh, so I strongly recommend it. It is free. It's at hmm. getpocket.com, and it's pocket. You deal with all that. Would you like to say it again, Father? Pocket. There you go. <laughs> I just wanted to give you the opportunity just in case you you, know, you needed it. I appreciate it sincerely. That's right. Actually, I, well, I was thinking about this. Uh, I, the website's really pretty. And uh, <laughs> I was going to just stick with Instapaper. But just looking at some of the feature sets, I might want to, to take a look here. Uh, it does give you a cool Windows 8 or Pinterest kind of look oh. with uh, boxes, and, and you get to see the images, and you can click on the videos, and they'll pop up. And it looks more like Windows 8 Metro interface than it does <laughs> Pinterest, mm-hmm. but it's really pretty. Josh, really have, pretty. Josh, have you seen any of the Windows 8 stuff yet? Uh, you know, I downloaded it to, to install it on my laptop, but I never actually installed it. So it's just sitting there. <laughs> it's just sitting there. Boxes and all. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, that's kind of sad. Well, yeah. we moved from our picks of the week. Mine was Mint.com. Josh's was <laughs> Thin Mint, Mint Thins. <laughs> and Father Ryan's didn't have Mint or Thin in it anywhere. It was GetPocket.com. I'm just trying to recap since I made such a botchery of that, that last uh, two segments. Uh, Heck of a segment, Father. Heck of a segment. That's right. That's right. We made it through, though. Um Father, do you want to? Is it you that does the audible plug? It's not, Father. It's Joshua, why don't you do the audio plug for us? Oh well, you know, um, as always, Catholic Underground is thankful to Audible.com for their sponsorship of our podcast. Audible is the world's leading supplier of audiobooks and spoken word digital audio. So if you surf over to AudibleTrial.com/slash Catholic Underground, that's AudibleTrial.com/slash Catholic Underground. They're going to give you a free 14-day trial and a free book download. So you can cancel your your trial membership at any time and keep the book. But the membership offers you one or two audiobooks every month and gives you access to a ton of free and discounted materials. That includes books, magazines, daily newspapers like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. So don't let your time behind the wheel or the stove or in the gym or wherever you find yourself be wasted. Or the gym stove. Exactly. You know, the gym stove. <laughs> uh, this week, the book we're recommending, I know Father Ryan is going to enjoy, is, is Treasure, in, Treasure in Clay, which is the autobiography of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Yeah. Um, in this book uh, is included the, his childhood and seminary reflections, as well as Archbishop Sheen's views on media, stardom, pastoral work, his travels internationally, conversions, Vatican II Mary, and so much more. You can expect to hear many of the saintly and sage communicators' famous phrases and inspiring stories. Uh, in this book, in Treasures in Clay, you'll find out why Bishop Sheen is now called Servant of God, which, of course, is the first step on the way towards canonization. Yeah, I, I'm excited. I'm reading this book, actually, um, on, on my Kindle, uh, although mm-hmm. I'd imagine that the, the Audible one would be very cool, too. Um, but uh, it's amazing to, to hear uh, how he developed his sermons, how he, uh, he wrote for television, how he delivered right. for television, uh, some of the stuff that went on um, in the missions, 
And uh, I mean, it's written in kind of a, a grandiose form. You can imagine uh, Archbishop Sheen telling it to you as if it really, you know, as it was happening, you know. Exactly. Uh, but uh, but a really, really good book. And so uh, if you get that on Audible trial for free uh, by signing up, you actually will help us out because uh, Audible makes a nice little uh, gift to us for every free trial that, that, you, uh, that you try. So thank exactly. you again. AudibleTrial.com slash Catholic Underground is the way to do that. All righty. Well, uh, that's it for this week. Uh, if you want the links and the notes that we mentioned on the show, you can follow us on Twitter, you can follow us on Facebook, and you can get all that by going to Catholic Underground. That's the, the best way to do it. That's the way to find out everything about us. You can also see all of the stuff that, uh, that we've been working on. If you want to find some video from our partners over at Salt and Light Television, we also do that. And uh, you can also make yourself heard at CatholicUnderground.com by, uh, by clicking on the back chat area. So there's, there's plenty to do uh, on back chat uh, or on CatholicUnderground.com. Joshua LeBlanc is the keeper of the sprocket locket key in his outer jacket pocket at Bayou Land Computer Solutions. He's at J.R. LeBlanc on Twitter. Thank you, Josh, for joining us. Thank you. And uh, you know Father Ryan, his church is online, actually. It's one of them internet churches uh, on, at <laughs> CampyCatholicChurch.com. Um, he's at Fr Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us. It's been my privilege, Father. I hope so, because it's been a strange, <laughs> strange episode. <laughs> uh, and you know me, I'm Father Chris Decker. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us here on the Digital Continent. We are CatholicUnderground.com, and we are Faith Gone Digital. We somehow will see you next time.